Okay, very good. Our first presenter is uh, Catherine Haver, Haver, Haverly. I have known her for many years, and so this is <laughs> embarrassing. Uh, actually, oh, I have a, a, another friend named Catherine Haverly, and the, your two names are so close, I always confuse you two. But you are undoubtedly not easy to confuse. Uh, she, I met Kat a few years ago when she did a sabbatical at the University of Wyoming. Her office was right across from mine, and it was just delightful to get to know her. We were actually reviewing the same book for different journals at the same time, and, and that was kind of funny. Uh, we had very, well, not terribly different perspectives, but we came at it from different approaches. But anyway, she's here today as the presenter of the Mari Sandoz Scholar Award. And this award is offered annually by the Mari Sandoz Heritage Society, and it's designed to encourage research on Mari um, and her work by offering, again, this annual award. And what we were really looking for when we designed this research award was just new perspectives, you know, not ne necessarily always on literature, but how might one view Mari from various uh, and sundry frameworks. And, and we really loved uh, Kat's pre uh, proposal. Uh, it's actually part of, a, uh, of the Sando series, the, the next volume that's coming out on uh, Mari Sando and the Battle of the Little Bighorn. So Catherine uh, is the author of three books on women's memoirs of the American West, and including Far Away Women and the Atlantic Monthly, which was a winner of the Thomas L. Lyon Book Award for Best Single Authored Monograph on Western Literature or Culture. She was a 2021-22 Fulbright Distinguished Chair in American Studies at Uppsala University in Uppsala, Sweden, and is presently a professor of English at Stockholm's Soderton University. She's also held faculty positions at universities in Japan, Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, and most recently, Minot, North Dakota. So we are <laughs> right up there with Paris, London, and Minot. You know. So welcome, Catherine. Uh, we're looking forward to your talk. All right. Um, Thank you, Renee, for that really nice introduction. And to the Marie Sandoz Society for giving me this award and inviting me to speak, which I really appreciate. And to all of you for coming out this early Friday morning. I hear it used to be much hotter in Lincoln a couple days ago. <laughs> um, so in May 2019, Renee proposed that I contribute an essay for her edited collection um, on Sandoz and her last book, which she just mentioned, The Battle of Little Bighorn. Specifically, she asks that I connect the volume in some way with George Armstrong Custer's widow, Elizabeth Bacon Custer. Renee wrote, I need an essay from a non-historian who understands the role of women in the West. And since Libby Custer played such a key role in promoting Custer's legacy, I thought an essay relating her to the book would be good maybe comparing the approach Sandoz and Libby took on Custer. Then she added, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Say yes. So who could resist such a plea? The only trouble was I hadn't yet read Sandoz's Little Bighorn book, nor did I know anything about Custer or the memoir, <laughs> Boots and Saddles, about her experiences with her husband in the Dakotas. And when I did start investigating, in other words, I read these books, I found that despite their shared subject, the distance between their texts seemed unbridgeable. There were so many differences, 1885 versus 1966, the fond memories of a grieving widow versus the analysis of a reproving historian. The most significant difference was that they just do not write about the same thing. Sandoz offers a granular account of the battle, but Custer only chronicles the events leading up to it. For maybe the first time ever, I felt sympathy for my students to whom I give exams, asking them to do things like analyze a monologue from Ju Romeo and Juliet in respect to a horror story by Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, just as with my students, the mind puzzle I, I was assigned threw me back on the fundamental practice of literary studies, close textual analysis. 
Comparing the narrative choices in these two books generates new insights about both of them, as I hope to summarize in this talk. To think specifically of, <coughs> to think specifically of Sandoz, this focus helps us see how she directly responds to the general Custer myth that his widow did so much to establish, which is why I've titled the talk, Marie Sandoz Rewrites Elizabeth Bacon Custer. Um, so she, she was, this, this is her, um, and she was, she was quite famous for accompanying her husband on the field during Civil War conflicts, on campaigns in the Great Plains, and this really made her singular, especially as she was rather gently raised, um, no natural adventurer or gender iconoclast, as you can see from the photo. Her death launched, his death launched her lifelong career of professional widow, advocate, best-selling author, and popular lecturer dedicated to a single subject. Spurring her advocacy, President Grant had publicly blamed Custer for the Little Bighorn defeat in which every soldier in the five companies he led was killed. She published three books about his campaigns with a stated, with a stated goal, quote, of bringing him before his people in his private life as a son, a brother, a husband. Throughout her books, he appears as both a selfless, caring husband and a selfless, caring leader who always put other people first. And by all accounts, she near single-handedly transformed his public image from that of ignominious failure to tragic hero. His books, her books are widely recognized to quote as brilliant propaganda that rehabilitated Custer's reputation and published his image. During the close to six decades that she outlived him, a kind of chivalrous respect for her, this exemplar of womanliness, suppressed criticism of him. It was only after her death that public anti-Custer commentary began in earnest. Yet while George Armstrong Custer's decisions and motives have long since been minutely dissected, Elizabeth Custer continues to be admired and even idolized. She still handled, critically speaking, with the same gallantry once extended her as an officer's wife and widow. In other words, her propaganda for the subjugation of native peoples is charitably overlooked. But an additional consequence is that even as this literal spokeswoman for Manifest Destiny is given a pass in respect to her ideology, she receives short shrift as a writer. Although she's been called, oh, you know, oh. Sorry, I just wanted to check. <laughs> um, she's been called one of the six most successful myth makers in US history, but she continues, to be she continues to be conceived as a widow first and as a writer only second. Her books are not assessed as rhetorical masterpieces, but rather as simply natural expressions of marital love. A quite recent description of her first book, for example, typically maintains, quote, Boots and Saddles offers a gentle, loving portrait of George Armstrong Custer, husband and man, but the person who knew him best. Elizabeth Custer's absolute devotion to him is revealed in every line of her story. Even contemporary scholars refer back to what's been called their grand and tragic romance, as if there's no way it cannot be the main focus. So for this talk then, I want to take the attitude of, who cares what the Custer's marriage was like? <laughs> I just don't care. Um, and even to say that somehow feels very disrespectful. Um, so the task that Renee assigned me, linking Custer to Sandoz, led me to look past the personal relationship and past even the historical events to think about what she does in her writing. Of course, as most of you here know, Sandoz poses her own disciplinary challenges with books that straddle the line of fiction and history. Her habits as a novelist energized her historical, study, her historical studies, tendering internal thought processes, imagining private conversations, and even inventing entire scenes. Most notably, she did not footnote. Betsy Downing comments that she was willing to, quote, distort or create the past in the service of producing vivid narratives and clear perspectives an unconventional methodology that poses difficulties both for professional historians and casual readers. Elaine Nelson puts it more strongly in relaying that historians were said to be repulsed by some of her methods. 
Um, and whether that's true or not, I, I don't know. I defer to the historians here. At the same time, her subject matter can make literary critics like myself hesitate, daunted by an assembly of historical material that seems to speak for itself. Certainly that's the case for the Battle of the Little Bighorn, in which she mines a wealth of oral interviews and archival research. Even though many view her last book as one of her strongest works, until recently it has received a very little scholarly attention. Of course, uh, that neglect is now being rectified. The University of Nebraska Press released a second edition just this spring with Elaine Nelson's schol scholarly introduction, while Rene Legrede's forthcoming edited collection will give us a whole new body of scholarship to think about. Here's the table of contents there. Um, some of the essays in that volume investigate narration and imagery, including those by Cheryl Wells and Taylor Hensel, which I'll soon reference. My focus will be how Sandoz manages to marginalize Armstrong Custer in the very book about the battle that made him notorious. His widow puts him at the absolute center of every story she told, while Sandoz pushes him to the very edge. Before continuing, I should say <coughs> you're now about to hear a lot about Elizabeth Bacon Custer at this Mari Sandoz Symposium. However, it's in the service of demonstrating what Sandoz, by contrast, does in her work, and I will soon return to her in good time. And moreover, that juxtaposition puts her in very good light um, due to their different positions. I'll also be parsing some of the language in the books quite closely, which hopefully will not be too laborious to follow by ear. And also in discussing Boots and Saddles, I usually refer to the author as Custer, and her subject by his first name, or rather his middle name, Armstrong, which uh, reverses the convention in discussing them, but it can be confusing even to myself. Um, but Custer is generally the writer, and Armstrong is her subject. Um, she began writing about their life together, in large part because she needed quick income, <laughs> unable to live on her widow's pension and saddled with the many debts that Armstrong had left. She already had a reputation <coughs> as a lively storyteller and was counseled to, quote, talk on paper as you talk viva voce. And she was assured that should she do so, <coughs> she'd conquer all mankind. And interestingly, even here in this book proposal to her, it's, you have a very um, gallant chivalrous tone that's taken towards her. She had a publisher even before she started and would find a champion in none other than Mark Twain. Writing of him taxes my every breath, she lamented, forced to call up buried memories. But it was a technical struggle, too, as she sought to so frame a little story of his home life that anyone would be willing to read. Boots and Saddles, or Life in Dakota with General Custer, was very well received, quickly selling 15,000 copies. Um, and it continues to just get reprinted in new editions, as the slide shows. That's just a screenshot from Amazon. The original is that gold book in the middle row toward the right with the sunrise and the bugle. My favorite one is the one in the left, um, top row towards the left with the actual saddle. <laughs> So that someone took that title very, very literally. Um, her, her yellow brick road to authorship was, of course, very unlike Sandoz's arduous trek. As I'm sure most of you know, hundreds of her submissions were rejected before her breakthrough in 1935, <laughs> when she won the Atlantic Monthly's nonfiction prize for old jewels. And my first introduction to her, to Mari, actually came in the 1990s when I was reading Atlantic Monthly correspondence at the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I came across these very belligerent letters <laughs> to her editor, Edward Weeks, in which she refused to consider any of the very reasonable changes, it seemed to me, that he wanted. And I remember thinking, how ungracious. They've just given you this big prize, and this is the attitude you take. Um, but of course, I've since learned that this was very typical of her and, and was, and, and actually, in, as I've learned more about her works, the, the, I've gone back to those letters, the changes he proposed, in fact, were not very good, um, and that she was right. 
Published, <laughs> published the same year as Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Boots and Saddles offered Americans an alternative way to map the nation's interior, conceive its recent history, and frame its racial conditions. Two more books followed, and the trilogy became the foundation for the so-called Custer legend, a noble, tragic hero. That means they also reinforce popular support for the ongoing violence of the US federal government against Native peoples. Boots and Saddles is told entirely from Custer's personal vantage point. Its opening sentence gives a braided summary of their courtship and Armstrong's Civil War career. And by paragraph two, she has accompanied him to the front in Virginia, having, quote, begged so hard not to be left behind. She encapsulates their marriage in a single line. It was a sudden plunge into a life of vicissitude and danger, and I hardly remember the time during the 12 years that followed when I was not in fear of some immediate peril or in dread of some danger. The book retains throughout its length this twinned focus, asking readers to view their married life and Armstrong's military activities in tandem. Ranging across the Great Plains, Custer posits her love affair as inseparable from the nation's bid to command the vast land in which it unfolds. And she depicts, she depicts real hardship and danger, including blizzards, threats of attack. There's also the fact that the officers have collectively agreed to kill her rather than let her be taken prisoner, um, which is some twisted chivalry about which she was not consulted. Um, <laughs> Yet all this notwithstanding, the prevailing atmosphere in the text is one of intimacy, play, and delight. She can make it hard to remember that she travels with an army engaged in military campaigns, even as the power and tension of the text lies in the reader's knowledge of their fate. And unlike many 19th century writers who wrote popular books about the West, Custer actually lived there. Nonetheless, Boots and Saddles can give the opposite impression due to how vapidly Dakota is figured. And these days, favorable, <coughs> I don't have COVID. I just did have COVID. <laughs> um, these days, favorable reviews of regional texts often allege that they make the land itself a character. Um, and in fact, I've never quite known what that means to make the land a character. But in Boots and Saddles, the land is definitely not one. Replicating a widespread conception of the Great Plains <coughs> as the great American desert, the landscape in her book appears as featureless and unstoried, near literally a blank slate. Its energy is entirely given over to Armstrong. His blue eyes and blonde locks get pride of place, and his horsemanship is described as follows in a typical way. His body was so lightly poised and so full of swinging, undulating motion, it almost seemed that the wind moved him as it blew over the plain. Yet every nerve was alert and like finely tempered steel, for the muscles and sinews that seemed so pliable were equal to the curbing of the most fiery animal. And this, and I read that and I think, I wish I could ride like that. But, and and it's, it's like this throughout. At once commandingly authoritative and enchantingly boyish, his constant register is one of joyous, high spirits, reveling in his adored wife, generous, generous leadership, and the liberty and vigor of a rugged outdoor existence. And here we see him po um, posed with Elizabeth and <coughs> some of the officers and their wives. And Custer, Elizabeth Custer, conceived of Boots and Saddles as a little book comprising views of the domestic life of an army family. And we get a sense of that kind of family feeling here. But of interest to me is the vagueness of the term army family as she uses it in her book, which she ren renders exceedingly capacious. The text is shot through with imagery of herself, Armstrong and his men engaging in a range of domestic and leisure pursuits in an outsized landscape that is figured as their expansive home. And I will say, as an aside, this is a cover of a book that I wrote in 2013. Um, and in reading Boots and Saddles, I felt deep regret that I hadn't read it 10 or 15 years earlier, since it exactly fits the arguments I make in this book, which discusses <coughs> women's autobiographical texts, uh, life narratives that portray unusual forms 
of domestic life in the West, and they do that in order to make claims about themselves or their circumstances of distinction and superiority. And many of these books, just like Boots and Saddles, became both bestsellers. Americans were really intrigued with that idea of women having doing strange housekeeping in the West. So having read Boots and Saddles, it made me realize that I was right. Um, <laughs> But returning to the Seventh Cavalry, it was notorious for its Custer clan. And again, this gives you a sense of it. He traveled with a remarkably large number of family members and associates. And there's a debate, there's debate about whether that contributed to the debacle that he had too many yes men. His brother Thomas was an officer, the younger brother was a contractor, their sister's husband was another officer, and a young nephew volunteered. Equally important, many of the officers with, were friends with whom he had long histories. Elizabeth was there, of course, plus another woman from Michigan that the couple had persuaded to join them in Dakota, whom she calls our girlfriend in capital letters. The group also included <coughs> a pack of a full 40 dogs, a flock of caged canaries and mockingbirds, and of course the horses whom the men treat, according to Custer, like precious children. And this is already a capacious understanding of family. Her biographer speculates that um, this was due to the fact that she had lost her mother and all three of her siblings before she was 13, leaving her only with her father. Um, but Custer leans on the notion even harder to make our family encompass every person present, the enlisted men, scouts, servants, and camp followers too. We were like one family, she insists. Everyone was so quick to sympathize, so ready to act if trouble came. And it's rarely clear when she's talking about our family in this way, if she refers to the inner circle, such as this one or the larger assembly. And in accord with this family conceit, the text is saturated with domestic scenes of cooking, dining, packing, sewing, nursing, and dancing. At Fort Lincoln, she reveals, there were about 40 in our garrison circle, and as we were very harmonious, we spent nearly every evening together. She deems the group a jolly family. The tenor is hugely jocund, incongruously, with countless references to jokes and laughters. And here we see some examples. Even at breakfast, peals of laughter went up. All were jolly, good-humored, full of their jokes almost too tired with the laughter, exhausted with the laughter, endless flow of laughter, even choked with laughter. So this persistent display gives the text an almost hysterical quality, and it's also not the slightest bit convincing that they were having so much fun. <laughs> Yet even as Custer appears as the, as the merriest prankster of them all, he is figured as a self-sacrificing father figure. He informs Elizabeth that, quote, our house should belong to everyone, and that as the wife of the commanding officer, I belong to everyone. They adopt paternal and maternal roles with the men who readily accept them as such. According to this presentation, it's inconceivable that he could have jeopardized them in a quest for personal glory, as critics such as Sandoz maintained. And her, th her theory was that he took such big risks because he had ambitions to run for president, and so he needed to make a name for himself. Nor would one ever know from reading Boots and Saddles just how many immigrants with conflicting interests comprised their number and how dismayed he was about the ragtag nature of his Indian Wars troops. Part of showing him to be the perfect selfless leader is showing him to be the perfect selfless husband. The two roles are presented as identical. At every turn in the book, we see him lifting, carrying, reassuring, and teasing Elizabeth, and the other officers treat their wives the same way. She states, and this is here, I wonder if it will seem that we were foolishly petted if I reveal that our husbands buttoned our shoes, wrapped us up if we went out, warmed our clothes before the fire, <coughs> Pour the water for a bath out of the heavy pitcher and studied to do innumerable little services that a maid would have done for us in the States. Willing subjects, they view their wives as queens. Husbands like these, she implies, surely must be pursuing a just cause. Therefore, her affirmations are entwined with her denigrating remarks about Native American gender roles. 
Deploying a widespread stereotype, she insists that an Indian wife is her husband's faithful slave. And the one time an officer is shown abusing his wife, the consensus in the group is that, quote, nothing but a long life among the Indians and having the treatment of the squaw before him would cause a man to act with such brutality. Portraying her own companionate marriage, in which she is not a slave but a queen, therefore thereby becomes a political act, an assertion of white superiority that justifies conquest. The last sight of the cavalrymen is their marching out to the tune of The Girl I Left Behind Me, and the narrative concludes with a shocked new widows in mourning. Custer leaves the battle itself unrepresented. The main reason for this choice clearly is that the subject was harrowing, but it also aligns with her practice of speaking only from her own experience. Her authority came from her firsthand reports of what she saw and felt. The book ends with a selection of letters Armstrong sent her from the field while apart, with the consequence that to the very last, their relationship is the focus of the book. Um, so her Custer's memoirs, they, they're, very, they're very poignant to read in some ways. Um, but Sandoz helps us see their insidiousness, exposing the frontier mythologies that she tapped into and amplified. In her book, Armstrong's mission is perverse. The Battle of the Little Bighorn tackles head-on the Custer legend that Sandoz believed contributed to the massacre at Wounded Knee at the hand of Custer's regrouped unit just five years after the publication of Boots and Saddles and the very year as one of its sequels. Sandoz maintains that Custer's larger-than-life status incited, incited the bloodshed. Quote, the exaggerations help push one section of the 7th Cavalry into the most barbaric conduct 14 years later when they mowed down women and children with Hotchkiss guns at Wounded Knee in 1890, shouting, some reported, here's another blast for Custer. Like Boots and Saddles, Little Bighorn was produced under exceptional personal circumstances. It was written while Sandoz was undergoing uh, treatment for terminal cancer and published posthumously. The product of years of intermittent research that reached back to the 1930s. The second edition finally came out this year, shown here, having been out of print for decades. Yet even now, proving Custer's enduring romantic allure Promotional copy for the book, which is framed in a scholarly way, describes it, quote, as a beautifully written account of the battle in which General George Armstrong Custer staked his life and lost it. Um, needless to say, such a dramatic framing of his endeavor does not accord at all with how Sandoz presents it. In fact, the book really isn't a book about Custer at all. Her, the Battle of the Little Bighorn begins at the exact point at which Boots and Saddles leaves off with the 7th Cavalry departing for its last campaign. Covering a quite brief time span, it's densely written and proceeds with deliberation. Her editor had enthused that the, narrator, or sorry, that the narrative carries the reader along at a gallop, but that was not my own experience. Um, I found it quite hard to read really, page by page, because it's very dense. It did not gallop me along. Um, it, it, instead, it was the kind of book that reward, it rewards rereadings, I'd say. And in her forthcoming essay, Cheryl Wells, um, he, she does a, a she, she demonstrates, she collects some quotations from contemporary reviewers showing that um, they, were, they most, they either hated it or they loved it. It was very divided, the response. But then they all seem to unite um, in comments about its authentic, sensual immediacy. Um, and here's a list of some of the comments she compiled indicating the potency of the book. Um, sounds like one of those Seventh Cavalry bugles, sounds of 90 years ago ringing through the pages. One is almost able to taste the dust. Words race along like raindrops. Flowers bloom along forgotten trails. It assaults the reader's sensibilities. The smells, the sights, the sounds of dusty, hot, exhilarating, and savage fighting. To say that I was absorbed, excited, impressed, edified, and pleased is an understatement. It is a wonderful book, so rich in the sights, sounds, and smells of the country that I not only felt I was back there, but back there at the time of battle. And Wells goes on to argue in her essay, that the sens sensory material actually came from Sandoz's childhood experiences in Nebraska, 
and her more later, less pleasant sens sensory experiences in New York City. And here um, on the left is a page from the bi bibliography that ends the book, and on the right, the opening page of the first chapter. That selected bibliography uh, includes Boots and Saddles, as perhaps you can see, under Custer, Elizabeth B. Sandoz never mentions that book within the text itself, but the opening paragraph re recollects it with, the with, it recollects it with the bugle call of its title. Off below at the bivouac of the Seventh Cavalry, the trumpet sounded Boots and Saddles, the call thin and fading, but golden against the wind. And in my view, her choice not to respond directly to Custer's claims, even as she invokes the book, has its own implications, a lack of engagement with an unworthy predecessor. And in her earlier historical novel, Shea and Autumn, which I'm sure many of you know, she had rent any illusion of the Custer's ideal union by referencing Custer's relationship with a Cheyenne captive and the son she believed they had together, um, which is a theory that turns out not to be true. She represents the affair as common knowledge and is managed in order to deceive Elizabeth by the party at large. Quote, when Custer's wife was coming to him, the Cheyenne girl was sent back to the Indians where the sun was born towards the autumn moon. Little Bighorn, in contrast, simply takes no interest in Armstrong's personal life, according it not a mote of attention. Moreover, it routes any of Elizabeth's lingering authority as a chronicler of the regiment by making her an inconsequential character. Mrs. Custer makes only a cameo appearance in the appendix in the company of several other women who come out with picnic campers to say goodbye to their husbands as they depart for their last fight. And in this book too, Sandoz presents her, presents Elizabeth as a deceived wife, although in a different context, quoting from one of Armstrong's last letters to her, which also happens to be featured in Boots and Saddles, she states that he outright lied to his wife in boasting that he was the first white man to enter the territory. Custer knew better, she states. But more fundamentally, she undoes Custer's portrait of the 7th Cavalry as a jolly family headed by a fatherly leader. The regiment we see in her book is composed of competing factions and commanded by an egotist seeking to advance his own career. In a post-Civil War landscape with a smaller army and fewer opportunities to rise to the ranks, ambitious officers deliberately kept the Indians stirred up, in her words, pursuing native bands to prove their abilities, even against their superior orders. Thus, thus she characterizes the Great Plains as a quoting, or sorry, a hunting ground for military trophies. And from here, I'd like to look more closely at the cinematic opening chapter, Departure from the Yellowstone, which dramatizes the regiment's departure from, for, it, it dramatizes the regiment's departure from Fort Lincoln, and then Custer's announcement of his decision to launch an active campaign to essentially attack, and then the uneasy night that the men pass as they digest the implications of his choice. So there's, so there's a lot happening in very few pages. The nature of Santos's claim about Custer is self-evident, that he's a narcissist, he's feckless, he's reckless, but the narrative ways that she advances this claim are not. And therefore, in the following, I look to identify her textual strategies. She presents Custer as one actor among many. She destroys the illusion of his troops as family by entering into the mindset of a range of people with differing motives and views, including officers, enlisted men, and native scouts. Finally, she marginalizes him by limiting access to his interiority. Whereas readers know what many of the other participants thought, felt, knew, wanted, or feared, our primary access to his thoughts and emotions comes through these other men. This choice has the effect of actually emptying Custer out of the book. She renders him oddly elusive and remote, even as she maps his choices. Hensel, in, in the forthcoming volume, figures this seeming paradox as follows, quote, while Custer is assuredly the central character of the book, he is less of a protagonist and more of a fulcrum around which the text revolves. And the epigraph signals from the start this radically reoriented perspective in quoting the Oglala Sioux chief Low Dog, 
I hear the alarm, but I did not believe it. I thought it was a false alarm. I did not think it possible that any white man would attack us so strong as we were. First per the first person to speak within the narrative is also native, one of the scouts. And only then do we hear from Custer, but in an indeterminate utterance. And that's here. Um, one of his officers had enjoined him to not to race ahead to seize all of the glory for himself. Now, Custer, don't be greedy, wait for us. With a very slight stammer, he replied, no, I, I won't. The ambiguity, she states, was left hanging like a puff of pipe smoke over the shoulder as he galloped off, the wind whipping the collar, sorry, the color of his standard behind him. The next scene takes place in a setting familiar to readers of Boots and Saddles, in Custer's private tent. It is here that he announces, quote, his frank determination upon a personal Indian chase, even as far as Nebraska. And again, you can hear the language here, uh, that it's, this is not a flattering um, formulation. The men, saddled, the men settled around the commander's bed, everyone there from Major Reno down to the greenest second lieutenant, with Custer flanked by a brother and brother-in-law, another brother and nephew to the side, and his favorites around him. He angrily confronts the officers in the scene for doubting him, and she makes a point that his stammer was more evident. The response is a moment of, a, a moment of embarrassed silence among the men, not of Custer's family or favor. And that with this scene of dissent and dismay, she destroys Elizabeth Custer's illusion of the regiment as a massive, jolly family, showing just how many people stood outside his circle. And throughout the book, she keeps her focus on these outsiders, ranging from ranking officers to enlisted men to the scouts. Uh, Nelson has commented that Custer fans were aggrieved, not only by the fact that she criticized him so directly, but also by the interest she took in other actors. She gives us inside views of what they thought, felt, and desired, all that Terry had seen, knew, and understood, what every old timer knew, what Shirley the Renew, what some of the more observant noted, and she also depicts their various reactions to Custer's announcement, which include making wills, deserting, and getting drunk. Sandoz only inhabits the personalities of the historical figures who have earned her sympathies, as Hensel puts it. Accordingly, access to Custer's emotional state is routed through their perspectives, as in to the older campaigners Custard seemed less elated. There seemed unease about him. He appeared full of apprehension. And we always get these verbs of seeming and appearing and looking. Um, and then our, our, deepest light, our deepest look into his psyche comes um, from, this, from this passage here as they intimate his despair. There were some here on the rosebud who realized that Custer must feel trapped in the confining dimensions of the scout laid out for him. In other words, he was asked to do something too small, something that he did not think that he himself as this general um, should deign to do, so he went for something bigger. So he feels with his small scout, he's been assigned, trapped as a great winged eagle forced into a cage, making wild and desperate thrust against the confining bars, breaking plumage, talons, and beak. To escape his cage, he plungs, plunges into a grand destructive mission. And one of his officers concludes, I believe General Custer is going to be killed. This moody, perverse, and ultimately unknowable figure is utterly unlike Elizabeth's merry boy. And the, <laughs> and the odd absence of his perceiving mind from the text accords with his own absence, his inability to register the signs so clearly leg legible to everyone else, especially the abundant ev evidence of a native assembly far too large to take on. And I'll just point out that until I read um, Hensel's essay, somehow I managed not to notice the most significant omission in the book um, that she never describes his death. It, it's just, it's not there. And in fact, now that I think about it, in that way, he aligns with Elizabeth Custer too. That, that event that all of this is leading to is not described. Um, but instead, she keeps her narrative focus on the end on the Lakota and their victory um, and the scope of that victory. And a full map of her apartment in New York was given over to a hand-drawn map of the Plains Indians camp that she had worked on for over 20 years. Nelson documents that in completing the book, 
One of the big pro the, one of the big pushes at the final stage was to get the maps in order, which he was very committed to. There was the battlefield map and the council lodge map, which is shown here. Custer's boots and saddles, while set in Dakota territory, is all about the Euro-Americans passing through it. The place itself feels irrelevant. It's just a generic ground of conquest. But Sandoz reverses this dynamic. Rather than empty playground or setting for fantastic domestic life, she shows it to be a thickly inhabited and closely mapped landscape. And my final quotation should indicate how she does so. Adopting the, pers the perspective of the native women who first sounded the alarm, she recounts, troops were riding over the little hill that was all in bloom. The recumbent loco weed, like a painted robe under the feet, white, pale pink, and lavender, rose, vivid magenta, and deepest purple. The long row of blue, blue coats and sorrel horses in gray and brown was crushing the flowers into the gravel, flowers that had always ripened to a map of buffalo beans for the women to gather and boil in the meat kettles. Now enemies rode there on the hill of peace, come against them in plain daylight, coming along the pretty hill that had never shielded anything larger than the ant and the little gray jumping mouse, the horses cutting the bloom with their iron hooves, their manure defiling the sacred place where youth went for their puberty dreams. To conclude, Mary Sandoz's The Battle of the Little Bighorn reads as a reply to Elizabeth Bacon Custer's reminiscences, raising the legend she fixed in national imagination. Instead of a principled hero, she presents a man driven by private ambition. Instead of a jolly family, she offers snapshots of those not of Custer's family or favor and details their competing interests. Finally, she denies the man full interiority, choosing not to grant the access to his thoughts and emotions that she provides for a host of minor characters to offer views from within. She thereby renders him curiously unimportant. George Armstrong Custer is neither the protagonist nor the antagonist of her book. Instead, it showcases the arena wherein its events unfold, the land and its native inhabitants. With this emphasis, she shows that what really matters is not the motives and character of this particular American officer, one among countless others, but the places for which the Lakota, Northern Cheyenne, Oglala, and Arapaho warriors fought. She thereby refutes the legacies of both Custers, Armstrong and Elizabeth alike. Thank you. Well, this, this is the, the memorial that, that was made in 2003 on the site of the battle. So trying to reorient it so that it's not Custer's last stand, but something different, the massive victory. This is right outside of the uh, memorial to the Lakota Custer. Mm -hmm. Well, I no longer confuse it with like the Alamo. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, it's just interesting how, how pervasive that Custer legend still is, despite the fact, you know, it was such a fiasco and so horrible, and yet somehow, like, you, I, it just keeps cropping up still in the way he's referred to, and it's made me realize how, like, that hold that those American myths and legends have on people, that even when people know better, like, it's really hard to not to slip into that, that way of talking, even, you know, of course, the way it gets described, like Custer's Last Stand, um, as something heroic. And it just keeps coming up again and again. And then it's some of the scholarship, too, about him and about her, that they just can't stop talking about her marriage. Like, they just can't stop. <laughs> I mean, that was the most important thing for women at the time, just to be married. But even now, though, people keep thinking about her in respect to the nature of her relationship. Yeah, yeah Melissa? What was her publisher? Lip and Cot, Philadelphia. Yeah. It's I been asked done. who her publisher <laughs> was. <laughs> yes? Did you find that uh, friends or colleagues in Sweden uh, had an interest or a perspective on the Tuscan? I, I never did. This was like the f last thing I wrote in North Dakota. Okay. So when I think about this, um, 
Yeah, I mean, there's, there's some odd views about American history there. <laughs> it's not, it's hard to end here. It's hard to get away from like the, the party line. I mean, the things that get passed down because, you know, people are just sort of barely holding on to the rudiments of American history, which would be normal, and then getting things sort of revised or reoriented is a whole So Boots step. and Saddles sold widely? It did, it was really popular. There is something appealingly, I mean, there's something readable about it, but at the same time is very appalling to read that book. Yeah. There's a ref Go ahead. Test, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Perfect. So um, have you consulted other women's perspectives? So you talked a lot about like Custer, but how about uh, Fetterman or any of these other folks? Have you consulted or seen other materials related to kind of this specific study to kind of influence how you talked about your presentation today? I know that was a loaded question, but. <laughs> well, I bet you have. <laughs> no, I mean, I know that's, that's your field. No, I didn't. Well, Fetterman is, that's the battle, right? Mm -hmm. So who are you thinking of? So women wrote about Simply just other wives of officers. No, really but I tried to get a student of mine to do that for her thesis, her bachelor's thesis. I was so excited about it. I didn't want to do it, but I thought, <laughs> I thought she should do it because now I remember. So I was teaching a course on, it's like Willa Cather and I think Henry James, and then some bachelor students finishing their thesis, or trying to come up with things for theses, and her husband was in the military. They're about to be deployed to Nebraska, actually. And she had this good background in the American West, and she was interested in feminism and women's perspectives, and she had this military connection. So I thought she could have such a great, great project of looking at just what you asked me about, how military wives represent their experience or, or the, the campaigns. But instead, she wrote about YA novels and body image. <laughs> and I was disappointed. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate about the girlfriend that Elizabeth and Armstrong had? Yeah, I mean, I just found the language really interesting, and I, I didn't find out much about it, but she was a friend of theirs from Michigan, where she was from, and, and so she was friends with a couple, and they liked her, and they persuaded her to come to Dakota's, and her, her parents, of course, were very against it. Like, why don't you come out and travel with the military? Through the <laughs> um, but they got her to come, and so she joined them. And so there's several references to our girlfriend, and she said the other men thought of her as our daughter. Um, so again, her insistence on these family relationships are really interesting. And it also makes you th feel like it must have, there must have been something really unusual about it. I mean, that doesn't fit with our expectation of what it must have been like to travel. Like that, that photo I showed earlier with them kind of lined up in front of that tent. Like, there's something really discordant about it all. Hmm. And the Custers have never had any children. No. Mm -mm. So, so she was, you know, if she, for 60 years she was his widow, but she made a lot of money from it. She too moved to New York and she was quite wealthy when she finished, yeah. Can you use the microphone, please, oh. so the live stream audience can hear the questions? Oh, mm -hmm. Is there anything, any history about the son that the uh, Indian I, th woman? I think I think from what I read, they've disproven that theory, that in fact, he did not have a son with her. That it was something that Sandoz believed in and mentions, but that it wasn't actually true. But do people know more about this? Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a great performance. <laughs> Thank you.